Uh, I'm Warren Hogue, I'm advisor for external relations, and I'm happy to welcome you to this IPI policy forum on international justice in a time of transition. This event is organized as part of the joint peace and justice mission to the U.S. of the City of The Hague, the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Dutch Ministry of Security and Justice, and the international courts and tribunals residing in The Hague. <clears throat> The mission's goal is to enhance dialogue on the value of international law in an increasingly multipolar world and to heighten awareness of the importance of international organizations working the field of international law in The Hague. Now, public awareness is certainly on the rise thanks to two notable current developments. First was the conviction March 14th, exactly two weeks ago today, of the Congolese warlord Thomas Lubanga by the International Criminal Court in The Hague, the first ruling by the ICC since it began its work 10 years ago. <clears throat> and the second is the much anticipated verdict next month from the special court for Sierra Leone in the case of Charles Taylor, the former president of Liberia. That court is in Freetown, but for security reasons, the trial was conducted in The Hague. Navi Pillay, the UN's High Commissioner for Human Rights, said the Lubanga decision marked, quote, the coming of age, unquote, of the court. The International Center for Transitional Justice also welcomed the action, but noted it still raised questions about the court, including the length of the pretrial detention and the trial itself, as well as aspects of the prosecution's performance. Clearly, coming of age is a beginning, not an end, of this process. We have four distinguished and knowledgeable speakers to advance that process here today. And since you have their full biographies in your program, I will introduce them only briefly now, before asking Josias van Artsen, the mayor of The Hague, to make his welcoming remarks. Josias Johannes van Artsen is a former Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands and has been Mayor of The Hague, the city of his birth, <laughs> since being appointed... You okay? <laughs> no, I was just worried about <laughs> if you'd injured yourself. Um, uh, and has been Mayor of The Hague, the city of his birth, since being appointed to the post four years ago yesterday, March 27th, 2008. Mayors in the Netherlands are not elected, but are appointed by the Queen. Peter Tomka has been a member of the International Court of Justice since February of 2003, and the Court's President since February of 2012. He is a noted scholar and lecturer on international law, and is very much at home in this UN community, because he has held a number of ranking positions throughout the UN and in his country's mission here. He served as the permanent representative of Slovakia from 1999 to 2003. Willem van Genuchten is Dean of the Hague Institute for Global Justice and Professor of International Law at Tilburg University. He is also Extraordinary Professor of International Law at the Northwest University in South Africa and Visiting Professor at the University of Minnesota. Our final speaker will be David Tolbert, the President of the International Center for Transitional Justice. He has had long experience in international law, serving for nine years with the International Court for the former Yugoslavia, four of them as Deputy Chief Prosecutor. He has also held senior legal positions at the UN, both at the Khmer Rouge trials and with the UN Relief Works Agency in Vienna and in Gaza. It now gives me great pleasure to invite to the podium Josias van Artsen, the mayor of The Hague. Well, Mr. Chair, thank you, uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting us here uh, at this uh, renowned uh, institute, with, which I still know as the Peace Academy, but it has changed name, but uh, has the same reputation it, uh, it had in the, in the years I knew it quite well. Mr. President, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, The Hague is a good place for justice. This was the phrase 
heard in the streets of Nairobi by someone coming from The Hague while talking to a group of Kenyans. He struck up a conversation with men about a wave of violence that hit Kenya after the elections in 2007. The events cost 1,500 people their lives over a very, very short period, and hundreds of thousands of citizens took flight. The Kenyans, a tourist uh, spoke to in Nairobi, were quite clear in one thing. Only the International Criminal Court in The Hague was capable of bringing the suspected perpetrators of brutal violence to justice. There, hence, The Hague is a good place for justice. The Hague, international city of peace uh, and justice, anyone who thinks that, um, well, this is just a clever uh, form of city marketing and a marketing uh, slogan thought up by clever uh, advertising boys is on the wrong track. In the streets of Sirajevo, Nairobi and Kinshasa, the name of The Hague stands for hope. Hope for millions of uh, people hope that the crimes inflicted on them will not remain unpunished. Hope for a peaceful future. Our collaboration with uh, institute like, uh, like yours is essential to the shared security and well-being of millions of people. By advancing international justice and peace, we protect democracy in places <laughs> where it is vulnerable, stop human and drug trafficking, curb violence against women and children, and create global stability. Our citizens uh, benefit in the form of stability and, in the end, economic opportunities as well, as do people around the world whose lives are improved through our efforts, your efforts, and the efforts of the courts in uh, The Hague. The Hague. the Hague is a, a city, an open city without walls. We always say the, the wind of tolerance blows from, from the sea. The Hague has long-standing connections with uh, the United States as well. The Peace Palace, which always symbolized, is more or less an icon of international law in, uh, in The Hague. And uh, at The Hague, as, the, as um, Boutros Boutros Ghali said, legal capital of the world. Owes is, the Peace Palace owes its existence to the generous donation made by the Scottish-American steel magnate and um, philanthropist Andrew Carnegie. And President Theodore Roosevelt supported the creation of the Permanent Court of Arbitration <laughs> in The Hague. Um, this history, the work being done in The Hague has impact. The International Criminal Court has investigated and tries individuals accused of committing the most serious crimes. You referred, uh, Mr. Chair, already to um, the, uh, the, uh, the situation in, uh, in, in Congo. And of course, the, uh, but, but the president will, without any doubt, elaborate in a, in a few minutes about the important work of the International Court of, um, of Justice. And uh, if, if we look at um, the International Criminal Court uh, for the former Yugoslavia, uh, well, the former, the, the, the court is more or less about to try the Bosnian Serb leader Radglo, Radglo Mladic for genocide, war crimes, and attacks on thousands of civilians during the Balkan Wars in the 90s. In countries with a weak, uh, legal systems, these institutions, the institutions in The Hague, they ensure justice for all and maintain stability across international borders. As the world, as you know uh, and we know, faces new challenges that cross borders and ethnic and religious groups and threaten our common uh, ideas and the common society, so to say, the Netherlands is proud, and The Hague especially, to be home to these important UN uh, institutions in uh, the city. So thank you uh, for inviting us uh, during this, um, uh, this uh, forum. 
of this institute that uh, is about strengthening the position of these international institutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. But uh, we should not forget uh, the existence of uh, another court in The Hague, that's International Court of Justice, which is a court not for individuals, for individual victims, but uh, for uh, uh, seeking justice in relations between states. Uh, so uh, I am not going to uh, elaborate very much on international criminal justice system, although uh, I modestly also took part in uh, that process, which uh, culminated in 1998 with the adoption of the Rome Statute, and when the dreams of uh, many generations of scholars have finally uh, became reality, starting with the ideas of Vespasian Pella or uh, Henri Dondieu de Varbe. So I remember that in 1997, when I chaired the Sixth Legal Committee of the General Assembly, we adopted important resolution convening the conference to Rome, and I served as uh, vice chairman of the uh, preparatory committee uh, before the Rome conference. Uh, but uh, I participated from the point of view of a public international law uh, specialist uh, creating the new institution. Uh, I think it would not be appropriate for me to evaluate the work as the two presidents of uh, these institutions are not here. But on the other side, uh, there are times of transition uh, also uh, taking place originally. Uh, there was a major, uh, I would say, political shift in Europe uh, in 89, 1990, when uh, uh, Iron Cur uh, Curtain fell down, uh, Europe reunited. This had some impact also in terms of uh, international justice, because previously the states uh, to the east from the Iron Curtain uh, did not wish to bring matters before the International Court of Justice. They did not uh, recognize jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. That changed. Uh, currently there are six states from this part of Europe which have a declaration recognizing jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice in force. Uh, states from this region have brought either jointly by agreement or unilateral uh, different cases uh, before the court. Of course, the events in the territory of former Yugoslavia, which led to the creation of a criminal jurisdiction, uh, uh, so-called Yugoslav Tribunal, and I think that was a great impetus finally to then uh, uh, complete the efforts to create a permanent criminal court, because I think without the Yugoslav tribunal it would have been much more difficult. So these uh, uh, events in the territory of uh, uh, former Yugoslavia, this uh, rather violent uh, disintegration, also generated a number of cases for the International <laughs> Court of Justice. Let me mention uh, two genocide cases, uh, I call them briefly. Uh, uh, these are cases about the application uh, of the Convention on the uh, Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, one between Bosnia-Herzegovina versus, uh, f at the time, former uh, Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, Serbia, and Montenegro, the other by Croatia against uh, Serbia, uh, with a counterclaim by Serbia. That case is still pending, so I'm not going to elaborate anymore. But you have perhaps had the opportunity to read the judgment of the court in, uh, rendered in 2007 in the first case. But there was a case also brought by former Yugoslav of Republic of Macedonia against Greece about the agreement they uh, reached in 1995 in relation to certain events which occurred in 2008 when the applicant that wished to become uh, or to receive an invitation to become a member state of uh, NATO. Mm, uh, and there were a number of uh, other cases, including the advisory proceedings on Kosovo. So uh, this is just to uh, illustrate that these uh, transitions, geopolitical transition, transitions, can also generate certain cases, and not uh, for uh, what people usually perceive uh, in international criminal court jurisdictions, but also in uh, International Court of Justice as the principal judicial organ of the United Nations, uh, whose role is uh, 
to decide disputes between sovereign states and only states can appear before the court or to provide advisory opinions upon the request of the United Nations or some other international organizations which have been given the right to seek advisory opinion, uh, this right being given them by the uh, General Assembly. But um, uh, same events uh, can uh, mm, give rise to uh, judicial proceedings in uh, different kinds of jurisdiction, international jurisdictions, criminal, uh, Yugoslav tribunal, and uh, International Court of Justice. This can be illustrated by the uh, case which I already referred to, uh, case brought by Bosnia-Herzegovina versus Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. Uh, while Yugoslav tribunal had to determine individual responsibility, criminal responsibility of those who were accused of perpetrating uh, uh, crimes against humanity, war crimes, or genocide. Uh, the role of the International Court of Justice is different. It's uh, to uh, resolve disputes and determine uh, responsibility of states under public international law, either under uh, treaties or conventions or custom international law. And, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, case, the courts, uh, these two courts played a complementary role. Uh, Yugoslav tribunal having found a number of people responsible, uh, including uh, for aiding and abetting uh, genocide and General Kostic. And the International Court of Justice had to uh, deal with the issue whether the acts committed are attributable or not uh, to uh, uh, Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, Serbia, and Montenegro under the rules of public international law, and whether that state has complied with uh, its obligation. So, uh, International Court of Justice is a record of over 66 years of adjudicative work. I think it's has uh, firmly established its position as principal judicial organ of the United Nations. Uh, Yugoslav Tribunal is about to, in a few years' time, uh, successfully complete its mission. Uh, and uh, at the end, uh, many people have been pleased that finally, after 10 years in existence, International Criminal Court uh, has delivered the first uh, judgment and there are a number of ongoing uh, uh, procedures. So, uh, uh, Hague-based uh, international judicial bodies are doing their best to promote uh, justice uh, uh, on international level. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, we'll go directly now to Willem van Genuchten, the Dean of the Hague Institute for Global Justice. Willem? Thank you very much for giving me the floor, and uh, also for me it's a great honor to be here, um, given the opportunity to say a few words, by the way, on the nexus between peace and justice, a few words on transitional justice, and a few words on, let's say, what our institute, the Hague Institute for Global Justice, would like to contribute to solving these issues or at least making good analysis of these issues. I've been given 10 minutes, and you can knock me if I'm taking a bit too much time. But I will clean my watch, and then I think I can abide to your rules. Yesterday, I did read in The Economist a line saying that uh, you did come across as well, maybe, that China does need 8% of growth, economic growth, to maintain social stability. That's a clear, clear link between um, peace and justice, economics and justice. And another example of the link between economics and stability is amongst others the Arab Spring, or maybe I should say the Arab Springs. Uh, some of them started partly due to the unaffordability of food. We all remember the name of Muhammad Bouazizi, December 2010. Um, I think if you have a look at this case, it was basically because of frustration about his own future, frustration about lack of good uh, economic development, what it is doing to him, frustration about his own future, and in my terms, in terms of global justice, it was about, let's say, frustration of not being able to live a life in human dignity. This is, in the end, what global justice is all about. Uh, empirical research so far has shown, and to totally not surprisingly, that food, water, healthcare, and even education for children 
are often seen as priorities above elections. That's something we also have to take care of time and again. Uh, we have many assumptions in this field, but if you have a look at it with empirical eyes, then you often see that, of course, I would say food, healthcare, but also education for children is seen as priorities. And all this basically relates to prevention of conflicts and maybe uh, prevention of conflicts also in terms that these conflicts should not reach the media or the Hague, that they should not reach the International Court of Justice. I would now like to have to make four observations on transitional justice before I will translate that into my or our institute. The first one is a classical assumption that sounds that doing justice is by its very nature a contribution to peace. That's something we keep repeating. But of course, there are many complications uh, surrounding that assumption. Um, for instance, sometimes you need perpetrators to build up new <coughs> institutions. I think Afghanistan is a case in point, whether we did do it right or wrong. Anyhow, there was, let's say, a sequence. First, talk to people and use them in building up a new Afghanistan. And next to that, we could discuss maybe justice. And here we also talk about, let's say, do we need Joseph Kony? Became extremely popular again over the last couple of weeks. Did we need him for peace negotiations or not? Could we accept that he was not yet caught by the International Criminal Court or not? And how about, for instance, al-Bashir and my uh, left-hand neighbor, David Tolbert, his institution is working on these dilemmas time and again between peace and justice. And I'm curious to hear you. I might be in your notes, but otherwise I would be you curious. Are now. Okay. <laughs> um, and anyhow, another question might be, is a promise done to a major perpetrator of gross uh, violations of international law, is that promise done in the context of peace negotiations, does it have any value? Does it have legal value? Does it have moral value? Can you come back to that 10 years later uh, after a person is arrested? That's another type of dilemma. My second observation, or whatever I did call it, I think observation on transitional justice. The second one is that transitional justice is all about such things like demobilization. It's also about disarmament. It's also about the return of refugees. Etc. So take care. Talking about transitional justice also means that there is a lot of groundwork to be done, work on the ground. I'm only mentioning these three examples, but we lawyers maybe sometimes tend, sometimes tend to forget these aspects while they are extremely important as well. The third aspect, and I see several women, young women also in this room, peace talks are often done by men, definitely, while many women have often more suffered from the violations, and they might be also much more important as partners in the peace negotiations in order to really find stable solutions for the conflicts they are suffering from. Uh, our institute is also developing projects in that field. Number four is doing uh, justice to uh, doing justice to traditional justice means that one has to understand and to address factors leading to the conflict. Lawyers sometimes come in a bit too late, but of course we need to understand where the conflict come from, comes from in order to make sustainable solutions. It also means that we have to involve all relevant stakeholders in order to, in the end, gain legitimacy for solutions. If we do it top down, it might never work. And in our institute, one favorite way of saying is that global justice is not about sending. Uh, we can create a lot behind desk, but this is not about sending. You have to cooperate with all kinds of people on the ground. It also means that you have to take care of reparations to victims. And reparations might, of course, mean something in financial terms. It might also mean sometimes memorials. It might mean apologies or whatever. But take care. If you do not do justice to the real victims, you will never build up stable solutions. And maybe my last remark on this is that it is about rebuilding trust, trust, and trust again. The willingness to start talking instead of using the muscles again in a new conflict. And that brings me to our institute, if I have a few minutes. Uh, what is our way of working? I already said something about a legal mindset. We lawyers tend to frame issues as long as we can uh, until they fit in our frames. 
in our institute, in many cases, the problems will be leading and have to be leading. And of course, in the analysis of problems, law will play a major role. Legal analysis is important, but we will do it together with sometimes uh, people with an economic background, sometimes people with an anthropologist background, sometimes people with a philosophical background, in order to make a tailor-made analysis that is doing justice to the problem at hand. In each project, we will develop a robust scope component, as we call it, of international law. But in many ways, it will not relate to new international law. It will relate to existing standards and then talk about implementation, about effectiveness, about, let's say, try to make a difference on the ground. And that also means that each project will have to uh, lead to practical deliverables in the end. It's not about new books only, not about the new analysis only, but also to practical tools. And for that reason, we time and again think that it is important to start projects, not by doing the academic work first and then talk to uh, practitioners and talk on the level of practical use, but to do it from scratch. Start on that level, combine these views, and then use the academic brains uh, to work towards solutions. All this is something we don't have to do alone. I think it will be great to work with a range of institutes like this one and like uh, this one. To conclude, um, that is to say almost, um, this approach, as we call it, is something we are going to apply um, in a project on Libya. We are asked to do a huge project on uh, rebuilding stable and sustainable institutions. And here again, we think we should not do it from The Hague, but we should do it in close cooperation with people um, over there, listening to local leaders, to new leaders, to religious leaders, to NGO representatives, trade unions, uh, company representatives, in order to make tailor-made solutions. And otherwise, uh, that's my last line, otherwise we would l run the risk that we would be seen as steersmen uh, and being ashore. And that's something that we always have to avoid. Do it behind desks while not going into the mud <coughs> would never lead to durable solutions. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Willem, thank you. That was only nine minutes, so uh, David Tolbert, you now have 11 if you'd like. Uh, David is president of the International Center for Transitional Justice. Thank you. I might take 12, but, uh, uh, and it's a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank IPI very much, and uh, Warren, for putting this event on. And it's a great honor for me to be in an at, uh, a meeting organized by the uh, the state of the Netherlands, and it's a particular honor to be here with the mayor, who I consider to be my mayor. I don't consider Bloomberg to be my mayor. I want to be that really clear. I lived in The Hague for more than a de almost a decade, so uh, this man is, is my mayor. And if I've got trouble with the water, I'm calling him. I'm not calling him. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, <laughs> The topic, I think, today is really a, a very timely one, um, particularly because uh, I'm going to read the topic in, in two ways, uh, because I think, um, and particularly since we've had the president of the International Court of Justice talk, I will be amending it to the International, international Criminal Justice in a time of transition. And international criminal justice is very much in a time of transition um, itself. And then I think it's also interesting to talk about the role and place of international criminal justice in transitions. So I'm going to, I'm going to address the, this issue from, or the subject really, from uh, two, two aspects. When I say that international criminal justice is in transition, it's already been touched on, I think. But with the establishment of the Rome Statute and the International Criminal Court, we see a new architecture develop. We see the, the, the end, really, of the ad hoc tribunals uh, on, the, on the horizon. Both the ad hoc tribunals uh, for former Yugoslavia and for Rwanda are in their closed down uh, strategies or phases. I mean, there are remarkable records there, uh, the Yugoslavia tribunal. Uh, it's hard for me to believe, given when I look back to when I started in 1996, but that every, every indicted person is accounted for. And that's something I don't think we ever would have imagined. And Rwanda has, uh, has, a, has also a, a quite a record of accomplishments. But 
these institutions are coming to an end. The uh, hybrid courts, you made ref Warren made reference to the, uh, to the trial of uh, Charles Taylor, where we're expecting a judgment uh, next month. And uh, it's going to be coming to an end as well. The Cambodia tri Tribunal, where uh, the extraordinary chambers, where I did, uh, was the Secretary General's special advisor, uh, is uh, in a, obviously a very trouble phase, but its work will end as well fairly soon. So we see that, uh, that in terms of international criminal justice, going forward, we have the International Criminal Court and we have domestic courts. And this is the architecture that's created by the Rome Statute, and what I call it is the Rome Statute system, which puts the primary responsibility on states for, for investigation and prosecution of serious crimes, and the International Criminal Court as essentially a court of last resort. So in that, in that context, which we call the principle of complementarity, and don't look, try to look it up in your dictionaries because it's not there, but it's essentially that the, the, the ICC is complementing uh, or serves as a complement to national jurisdictions. Uh, if we're going to actually see account, criminal justice, criminal accountability work in practice, it's going to be primarily at the national level. And this is a huge challenge. Uh, under the statute, the court only has, the, has jurisdiction when national authorities cannot or will not um, take action. And at this stage, let's take the easier scenario, which is, is cannot, which, and these, these two questions of inability and, uh, and lack of political will are often intertwined. But even in the easier case of inability, it requires a great deal of resources, a commitment by states, and it takes an integrated approach that we haven't seen in many of the uh, conflict-ridden countries um, because it takes development uh, actors and development agencies working with justice actors and rule of law implementers. Fortunately, I think we're seeing at least some movement in that direction with the, the publication last year, the World Development Report, which, re which really recognizes the deep links between security, development, and justice. And I think this is something that this audience is aware of and that we, we need to, to grab onto because it, it gives us the opportunity to start to close those gaps. Um, there are a number of other issues, and, uh, and uh, the dean raised a, a number of them quite, uh, quite well. Um, one, he, of course, mentioned the, the peace and justice uh, debate or discussion, and there's not time to rehash that. But I do think it is, it is important for, for us to, to, to know that even though this debate goes back and forth, that the ICC is, and the ICC prosecutor is a new actor on the stage. Um, and essentially, with the adoption of the Rome Statute, uh, amnesties uh, for serious crimes, at least for those act for those negotiators tied to the UN and to other international uh, bodies, is off the table. So the creation of the Rome Statute and, and the introduction of the ICC prosecutor changes the dynamics very deeply for for uh, for uh, negotiators. Uh, and there are clearly short-term tensions that uh, to, that arise from that. Uh, I'll have to, I think we'll have to, I have a number of other points that I want to make, but I, I just wanted to, to, to put the, that on the table. I, I would, though, underline that peaceful societies really are not built on the shoulders of war criminals. And there has to be some reckoning for these crimes, and they have to be addressed. And there are a number of mechanisms, including criminal justice, but also, as the dean pointed out, reparations, truth-telling processes such as truth and reconciliation, uh, commissions, and also, very importantly, institutional reforms such as vetting so that perpetrators are no longer in security forces and that uh, the, the victim of crime, of the rape, doesn't go to the police station and see her perpetrator, for example. But I think this really raises a broader question that I'd like to, if I still have a few minutes left, Warren, to focus on to kind of close out my remarks. Um, and that is the question of does international justice, does international criminal justice restore 
citizens' trust in states' institutions. This is really the ultimate question for transitional justice inst institutions, for, for transitional justice, and for what we're working on. And I think the dean put his finger well on that. And I think this is a key test, uh, the key question that we really have to ask and the, the question of uh, when, we, when we look at international criminal justice, and particularly as we look at what's happening in the, in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, and in this regard, I th it's uh, an underline that uh, uh, moving forward from a mass atrocity uh, and massive human rights abuses uh, to a sustainable peace, uh, trials alone will not do this. A broader approach is necessary. But I think trials or prosecutions, criminal justice is, uh, very, is an essential element of this. The ICC does have a role to play, uh, whether it's actually conducting investigations uh, and trials <coughs> itself, or in other instances where it really helps catalyze the debate and civil society interest in justice inst and justice issues. And the, the dean talked about the importance of engagement by civil society and local actors, and he's absolutely right about that. You can see examples right now in Kenya and Colombia where this is happening, but again, I think we're falling short uh, in both of those instances and a number of others on accountability, uh, on the accountability front. If we turn to the Middle East and North Africa, which is on the, uh, uh, on the front page of the paper the, these days and has been over the last year or so, uh, the picture is, is quite mixed and in some cases bleak. Uh, we see in Tunisia, we do s most of the trials so far have largely been in absentia or uh, really perfunctory. In Egypt, of course, you've had the Mubarak trial, but that did not go beyond the crimes of the revolution or the, the short revolutionary period. And it appears to be much more for public appearance uh, rather than actually delivering justice. In Libya, of course, we have uh, arrest warrants for two individuals. Uh, the Libyan authorities are, uh, are continuing or are arguing that these trials can be held in, in country. That is really yet to be demonstrated, and there's some serious questions there. At the end of the day, of course, this is a legal question for the ICC judges. And in Libya, uh, a question that I don't think gets addressed sufficiently there are 8, 8 to 9,000 detainees that are held in Libya, uh, and um, not many of them, most of them not in compliance with the law, and their concerns about the, uh, the, the, the conditions of those, uh, of those uh, detainees vis-a-vis uh, -vis mistreatment and so forth. So obviously, this situation needs to be addressed quickly. I think as we look forward from our perspective at ICTJ and based very much on my prior experience, particularly in our work setting up the Bosnia State Court, which was a hybrid court in Bosnia that actually has been relatively successful in a, in a number of respects. If domestic investigations and prosecutions are going to be conducted in, a, uh, in, a, in an effective way, there has to be a great deal more planning if the complementarity principle is to work in, in, in practice. There has to be a great deal more planning from the beginning. There need to be needs assessments of, of what is ne necessary in that country to enable prosecutions or investigations. Um, these, this really includes a close look at the, the actual state on the ground, not what we want the, the ground to look like. And sometimes we get uh, a bit confused on that. So, and I think this is something international actors really need to insist on. Um, these are really incredibly difficult situations, but planning and mapping, knowing what you have in terms of witness protection, what, what, what's available in terms of courtrooms, what's available in terms of uh, court records, and so forth. These are the really practical issues that need to be, to, that really have to be addressed if we're going to see the principles, the high principles of the Rome Statute implemented in, process, in, in, in practice. I'll close with just a note on the, on the coming back to the role of the ICC prosecutor. Um, and it's obviously very important. We have a new prosecutor, and uh, I think, we, I think oh, we, we rightly have very high hopes for her. She has great experience, and uh, I know her, and I'm sure many of you know her, and we're, 
wishing her all the best as, as she commences her, her, her term in, in June. Um, and with, the, with, with the, the prosecutor, of course, that is a really tremendously difficult job because it's important to exercise your best judicial judgment. Uh, and you have, to, you have to really exercise your judgment very carefully from a judicial point of view. But I've always stressed, um, and many of you heard, have heard me say this before, the, the prosecutor, and this does go back to the, the peace and justice discussion a bit as well, the prosecutor needs a keen understanding of the political circumstances, particularly the political impact that his or her, most, many of the, all the prosecutors I worked with were with her, so I usually say her actions will have in the context where the, uh, where the crimes have taken place. So uh, that will continue to be a major issue as we move forward and uh, as we deal in these transitions. And I think my time's up, so I will stop there. There are, of course, there are a myriad of other issues we can, we can take up and the discussion, but thank you very much for that. Yeah, you're very welcome, David. Thank you. Um, I want to go to the floor in a second. I just have two questions of my own that arises out of what you, all three of you have said. And I think, um, David, I'll ask the question of you, but I mean it to be asked of all three panelists, and please just grab a piece of it. There are two questions. The one is the sort of obvious one right now, because it's about Syria, uh, and it's the basic peace and justice problem. Uh, what do you do when you have somebody who is suspected of committing mass atrocities? Um, do you give him immunity to get him out of the country and therefore save lives in the country? Or do you propose to prosecute him, which could have the result of making him stay exactly where he is and not serve those peacemakers who want to get rid of him? Um, the the, the case is now being called uh, the, the Yemeni formula, the Yemeni solution, of course, uh, went in the direction of give somebody immunity, get them out of the country, and then you can bring peace and stability to that country in Yemen. Uh, I think in Syria, it's going to be, it's a real clash. Um, I would hate if somebody said to me, which way do you think one ought to go there to make that work? That's one question. I want to, if, if the three of you are individually have any clarity on the situation, on the peace and justice argument when it, as it pertains to Syria. Now that we've had the example of Libya, the example of Sudan, the example of, of Yemen. And then the second thing I want to ask you something is, is David, that you just brought up now, which is um, a sort of a third ramification of the peace and justice argument. What do we do when a country itself says, no, we want to prosecute? Uh, they may be perfectly well-meaning. They may actually produce a just settlement. But the international courts or court may believe that because of the nature of the crimes, crimes against humanity, war crimes, atrocities, that this is for the jurisdiction of the international court. Is there a clear path there that the three of you who are proponents of international law, do you believe in cases like that? And you mentioned the case right now of Saif al-Islam Qaddafi and Sanusi, the, in the intelligence head, uh, where the Libyans themselves say, send them back here, we want to try them. Is there a clear path there? Should international law have jurisdiction, or should the local country have jurisdiction? Why don't you start, but okay. I mean for the others, too. Uh, the second question, I think, is uh, answered by the Rome Statute itself. Um, it, it says where uh, the, the ICC only has jurisdiction. Of course, in this case, we have the Security Council um, uh, creating the, creating the uh, the circumstances for the court to have jurisdiction. But at the end of the day, the test is really the complementarity test. And that is, uh, can the national authorities provide justice which meets a certain standard in that country? If they can do that, then they have the, the right to proceed. Uh, otherwise, the, uh, if the ICC has jurisdiction, then it's for the ICC. And this is a judicial question, uh, and that's what's being done in Libya. Now it's a question for the judges to make that judgment. So I think on that question, we have a pretty clear legal framework. Um, if, if you're one of, the, uh, one, of the, one of the countries that belong to the ICC or there's an ICC referral, there's a pretty clear legal test there. And, that's, and I think that's the, the straightforward answer. What I think is much more difficult is at the end of the day, uh, even in those situations, uh, you will only have a very small number of individuals brought to justice at the ICC. So 
what about the other crimes? What about the, and ma many of them massive crimes, how do you deal with that? Now, there are a number of transitional justice processes that are important to implement, but if you're going to hold people individually responsible for those crimes, then you're going to have to have national courts that work. You're gonna to have to have national prosecutors that work. So the ICC is important, but it's part of a system that's much broader. Do you want me to? Would anybody like to take the question of Syria? Yeah. Oh, good. I'll come back to it, but okay, go ahead, you go first. Maybe also a few remarks on the, the second question about the International Criminal Court, clearly the complementarity principle. It's my feeling that countries like Libya really deserve the chance to do it their own way, but of course then the public prosecutor has the right to say, I'm not convinced that this is done well, and then as soon as the public prosecutor has reasonable grounds to believe that he should make a case, then of course he has to convince the pretrial chamber, three judges, and if that's possible, then I think he might be right, and in the future she might be right, Ben Suda. Um, and if not, then still the system works. If the prosecutor thinks she has a case, but it is not a case in the eyes of the pretrial judges, I would say that would be the end of the story. So it's a reasonable system. As to Syria, I think we all know why Libya yes and Syria no. Most of us might have read the resolution of the 3rd of February, uh, the one that has not been adopted by uh, the Security Council. It was not even talking about regime change, but it was about, uh, let's say, organizing elections and then asking Assad to accept the outcome should it not be in his favor. But still, that was a bridge too far for China and the Russian Federation. And then the only situation we are in now is, do we trust Kofi Annan's mission over there or not? And my feeling is that if the uh, plan, which is now at the table, would become a reality, then the price has been high but acceptable. And I can be blamed for that, many dead bodies, but that's a reality. And military intervention would have caused many dead bodies as well. But if Kofi Annan's plan is not working out uh, well, and it might uh, lead to in the situation, let's say, continuation and continuation and so forth and so on, then this will be a balance you have to make up in a few years. And then we might say this is another shame for the international community compared to other shames we have seen, especially in the mid-1990s, Bosnia, Rwanda, Somalia, recently in Sudan. So it's uh, too early to my mind to make up the balance, and first of all it is the question whether Kofi Annan's mission will be successful uh, or not. So, sorry, yeah, I didn't mean to dodge the first question. I just, did, but, yeah, uh, I just wanted to get the involvement of others. I'm glad, to, I'm glad to take it on, uh, and uh, I think the dean and I are very much agreement on the second question. I mean, and there is a bias for prosecution at the national level. It's only in the exceptional case that you should have the ICC. <laughs> And I, it, it goes back a little bit, but in terms of your first question, I think it goes back a little bit uh, to, to some things I said in my earlier remarks. Um, one of the effects of, uh, of the, the, the adoption of the Rome Statute and the development of international humanitarian law, including guidelines for mediators, uh, is that um, really for, a, for, for those actors who are following the rules, for UN negotiators and, and, and others, um, amnesty for serious crimes, that is crimes against humanity, genocide, war crimes, is off the table. It's no longer something that you can put on the table. Um, and this does create that tension that, that, that you, you, you've mentioned. Uh, um, mediators in the past might well have tried to offer an amnesty. That is no longer in their quiver. And it is part of the development of the Rome, uh, one of the products of the Rome Statute, and the and the and the, the movement um, over the last 20, 20 years or so, that that is the case. Now, um, I would argue that's an important principle. We, uh, I, I think, it's important that we don't have impunity for the world's most serious crimes. I, I realize that can create short-term tensions for negotiators, and I think we have to be honest about that. But at the end of the day, the principle is uh, that uh, there cannot be, um, at least in, an, in a normative sense, uh, amnesty uh, or forgiveness for those, for those crimes. Now, as a practical matter, uh, when you have massive number of crimes, you're not going to be able to prosecute everyone who's committed crimes. And that's one of the reasons that you see the, 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 the language is developed for all of these courts 
to, to investigate and prosecute those who are responsible for the most serious, uh, the most serious crimes. And there are methods of looking at trying to address these issues in Colombia, for example, the peace and justice law, which has a, a lot of issues, and, and ICDJ is working, working with the authorities on this, but where you have a, 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 you have a basically a guilty plea in exchange for a set sentence. So there, there are ways to, to address this, but uh, the, the, the world has changed a lot for mediators as a result of both the adoption of the Rome Statute and the presence of the ICC <laughs> prosecutor. Uh, I'm going to go to the floor for questions. I have three already. Uh, when, you, when we get to you, please uh, identify yourself and hold the microphone very close to your mouth uh, because we are webcasting, and that's the only way the audio will work. Um, I'm starting in the third row, Mr. Karimi, on the first row, John Hirsch, and the gentleman here in third. We'll take three questions at once and then answer them all together. Thank you, Chairman. My name is Karimi. I'm from Mission of Iran to United Nations. Uh, within the context of uh, prevention of conflicts, as you know, tension between the United States and Iran is increasing. And the United States says that uh, perhaps the attack is imminent, either directly or through proxies. I would like to have the view of the panelists uh, within the context of prevention of the conflict, what legally the individual country, either Iran or the international in the situation could take to prevent that conflict? Thank you. Thank you. John Hirsch. Uh, I'm John Hirsch from the International Peace Institute. First of all, thank you all very much, Mr. Mayor and everybody up here. Um, you were all very nuanced in your analysis, which I thought was terrific. But what I want to ask each of you, I want to draw you out, is what you think is the impact of these criminal decisions on reconciliation in these countries. So for example, in the former Yugoslavia, many articles have been written to the effect that these communities resent the decisions of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. They don't really welcome this. They think this is unfair and any Serb who was convicted has been treated unfairly, and so on. There's a book called They Would Not Harm a Fly that maybe many of you read by a woman named, uh, a journalist named Drakulic from Croatia talking about how hypocritical all these people were. They didn't really believe what they said, but all these communities sort of said, oh, that's so unfair to convict so-and-so. In uh, Sierra Leone, the court has spent, I think, $200 million They've convicted uh, five or six people. Most of these, other than Taylor, are totally low-level, unimportant individuals, totally forgotten. Do you think that this whole process has led to reconciliation uh, in Sierra Leone? Uh, so in other words, I'd like you to kind of relate these criminal decisions to what happens in those countries. Thank you. Thank you. Finally. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson, for giving the floor. Mohammed Ibrahim, Islamic law expert with the United Nations uh, peacekeeping operation. Um, my question is, how we could get out of the dilemma of the national justice versus the international justice? I worked like in seven years in Afghanistan and Sudan. What we do in order to maintain peace through justice, that we try to build the capacity of the judiciary, uh, having ownership of the country, but at the same time, this takes time. I think in building any from experience, it takes seven years at least. So in this case, we come in another dilemma, which is justice delayed, justice denied, versus justice rushed, justice crushed. When we ask these countries to do justice immediately, uh, we are really making a joke with them. So I think, again, um, challenging the international uh, court at the same time, some countries think that this is undermining their jurisdiction and sovereignty. How about going for regional organizations and instruments like the African Union, League of Arab States, Organization of uh, Islamic Cooperation, as a midway between them, uh, also for recognition of cultural relativism, these organizations might be a midway solution to come out of that. Also, most of these countries, after the long conflict, most of the judiciary have been destroyed. So this would be midway between them. Thank you very much. Peter, could I ask you to grab those first, and then we'll go to Willem and uh, David? Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Well, I don't know whether I have heard well uh, the diplomat from the mission of uh, Islamic Republic of Iran to the UN, uh, but he mentioned the bilateral relations between uh, Iran and United States and the deterioration of that relationship. Um, let me tell you that uh, it seems to me that uh, The Hague provides one of the few venues where the two governments are still talking directly, uh, and this is in the context of the Iran-U.S. Claims Tribunal, uh, because there are Iranian and American arbitrators and uh, three international arbitrators and agents are meeting and cases are being still handled through that institution. So the institution has not been mentioned, but uh, in my understanding, it's perhaps one of the few, if not only, a place where there is a still direct talk between the two uh, countries, although on a discrete, uh, in a discrete way. Mm, turning to uh, the impact of criminal jurisdiction on reconciliation, it's again not, uh, let's say, uh, something what relates ne necessarily to the International Court of Justice, although I'm not speaking officially on behalf of the court, because otherwise I would have to convene the court to have uh, extensive deliberations <laughs> in order to agree on the statement to be made. <coughs> so I, I speak in a private capacity. But my feeling is also that uh, frequently uh, one does not see direct impact. Uh, look at uh, uh, excellent work that has been done uh, by uh, Yugoslav Tribunal when you look at the relationship in, uh, of uh, three communities in Bosnia and Herzegovina and the difficulties they faced uh, to form the government after the elections. It took them more than a year and a half. Uh, so, uh, um, and it's true that uh, some decisions are uh, yeah, of criminal courts, international criminal courts, are welcomed by victims, but on the other side, uh, uh, rather criticized by a larger group of uh, population. I have in mind, for instance, the decision which is on appeal now in the Gotovina case, that uh, General Gotovina still remains for a uh, number of Croats, uh, kind of a person of a national importance. Uh, well, uh, a dilemma between national justice system and international justice system, I think really we have to pay fully respect to the principle of complementarity and not to expect too much of international criminal <coughs> court system. I think only the major cases have to be brought there. There are also limitations uh, how many cases these uh, courts can handle in a timely and efficient uh, way. So uh, whenever uh, there is a possibility to prosecute nationally, there should be a support of international community for those efforts, including United Nations uh, support in terms of expertise, etc. So if a uh, state has, uh, for instance, a resumed membership in the Human Rights Council, uh, although the situation may not be uh, yet a good one, but still the uh, United Nations perhaps should uh, provide the assistance if there is the uh, effort to bring to justice those perpetrators, because this criminal justice will be also delivered closer to the victims. Um, they will be able to follow these criminal proceedings, I think, uh, in a better way if this takes place somewhere else. What is important that there is uh, a kind of a deterrent uh, effect of international criminal court system that if uh, persecution is not uh, domestically, then uh, there is a possibility of international criminal proceedings. So uh, if I may uh, just briefly then add uh, on two questions you raised, uh, not to be perceived as somebody who tried to avoid it. Well, peace and justice, I think, primary objective is peace. Uh, that's clearly in the Security Council, in the Ch United Nations uh, Charter. And as long as uh, the matter is before the Security Council, uh, which bears the primary responsibility, uh, I would say that um, this is uh, uh, the most important to, uh, to restore peace and then uh, to sort out uh, the situation. You referred to another country where there was a kind of amnesty granted. Well, that was domestically, nationally, because that was uh, what uh, the, the forces within that country, perhaps with some international input, uh, agreed on. So uh, that's my uh, private comment on your uh, question. And the second, I think I respond in the context of dilemma between national and uh, yep. uh, international justice. There was a reference to 
regional instruments. I can tell you that currently there is a case between the International Court of Justice between Belgium and Senegal, which concerns obligation under the Torture Convention. Uh, as uh, former president of Chad lives, has been living since 1990, Isenabre in uh, Senegal. Mm, uh, Belgium <laughs> claims that uh, Senegal is not in compliance with obligation either to prosecute or extradite. Uh, the matter was brought to the African Union, which uh, has given a mandate to Senegal to try on behalf of Africa. Uh, it's an abre, but uh, that mandate was given in 2006. We are now in 2012. Uh, and uh, of course, there are, I understand, uh, certain justifications provided by Senegal in, in terms of uh, resources, etc. So I'm not going to elaborate any further on the case as it, it's uh, sub judice and the court will have to decide on in light of the arguments. If you are interested, you can go to the court's website and to read the pleadings of the parties and transcript of oral arguments. Thank you. I will hammer out a few answers. Um, Iran. I think we are now in the midst of the discussion between so-called preventive self-defense and preemptive self-defense. And preventive self-defense is never allowed, as you know, since the Nicaragua judgment of the International Court of Justice. And preemptive, that's of course, is it an imminent threat? And do we have enough evidence? And is there the willingness to use nuclear means? And the core question, of course, and that's something we cannot establish right here, is whether Iran is that far already. Is the material ready, or is it ready for use, or is it there? So that's in the end a factual debate, how far is Iran? And then it might fit maybe in the concept of the preemptive self-defense. As to the impact um, of, let's say, people being frustrated by international legal decision-making and then telling each other, the neighbors and so forth and so on, how far the Hague is and how bad it is and so forth and so on, I would say, seriously, listen to these people, do serious research, where do these arguments come from? I would do a lot of oral history projects, uh, listening to them, but not only an interview or something, but really taking care of their views. And for instance, what courts can do is have no biases in the prosecution as such, uh, going after specific ethnicities more than after others, unless, of course, the facts to justify this. And the third, uh, the links between, or the conflicts between national justice and international justice I strongly agree to Peter Tomka. It's again about complementarity. It's again about, I think international law should be modest, but it should be there. Listen first, it should be there, yes, but take care. This is the order of things. And otherwise, we, are, we do think that we are quite rich in international law while we do not reach anything whatsoever. Um, of course, this is again about the legitimacy, uh, legitimacy issue. Also about who are you talking to locally, who exactly, who represents whom, and things like that. Regional organizations, I would say, yes, we are doing a lot of good in the human rights field, European Court of Human Rights, the Inter-American Inter Court of Human Rights. I wanted to mention the African ones that are not well functioning. In the field of peace and security, I think regional organizations are doing not much yet, and there should be much more. We all know f line and fast last line. <laughs> we all know that the African Union was frustrated about non-actions of the United Nations and many African territories and then one decided to take on board the Sudan operation together with United Nations. So far I don't think it's a big success but it's a learning process and it is at least a good step towards something that should be done more often to my mind. Thank you so much. I'll um, not repeat um much of the last two speakers who I agree with uh, on the points that they've raised. Um, I would, on the, on the question of, I think you framed in terms of reconciliation, I would probably frame it in terms of restoring civic trust in that society, but, but, but yeah. Um, I'd like to first, I think there's a, a more overarching uh, point to be made, and then there's a specific point to be made about uh, criminal processes. And I think the first point to be made is that uh, criminal justice and prosecutions and investigations and trials are not enough to address this situation. And that's at the heart of ICTJ's uh, work. Um, yes, it's essential that those who are most responsible for the most serious crimes are held accountable in criminal processes, but 
it's also uh, essential that uh, the truth comes out. Truth and reconciliation commissions, truth telling processes, very important. A truth commission can tell the story in a much, much broader way and identify the, the roots of this conflict in a way a court judgment is not intended to nor can do. It can also frequently lead the way in a fragile society before, uh, which is not ready for prosecutions of senior officials and uncover evidence. It can also make recommendations regarding prosecutions or uh, regarding reparations and institutional reforms and frequently does. Um, and there have been some 40 of them and I'll, I'll, of course there's a lot of attention focused on South Africa and the amnesty provisions of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And, but actually the other 39 don't have that feature. So that's, um, and that's some time ago. So, uh, and also reparations programs are really essential to, to recognize the, the, the suffering and the injuries that victims have and help them reestablish civic trust. And at the end of the day, you, institutional reforms, particularly the police and military that have committed the abuses are essential. So this has to be a much wider approach than a handful of criminal trials. So that's the first point I would make, and, and that's really a critical point, and everything I would say today would be framed in those terms. Um, and, and because at the end of the day, you're trying to change the relationship of those of, of, uh, within that society. You want to establish civic trust. You want to, re you, you want to uh, particularly for victims, bring their relationship back into a much more normal situation rather than uh, being marginalized. And it's particularly important with marginalized groups. Uh, women and, and gender crimes are really quite prevalent. Uh, children are frequently abused. Uh, other marginalized groups, indigenous people. So all of this, I think, I would, I would, I would use to, to answer your question. I would say on the impact of criminal prosecutions, um, there's, a, there's a very nuanced answer that I can't give. If, you're, if you want to talk, uh, there's not enough time, but if Diane Ortlicker has, for example, conducted some uh, very interesting studies in Serbia and in Bosnia, both, talking to hundreds and hundreds of victims. Um, and you're right that there is a mixed picture, but the picture is probably a little bit better than, than one, mm -hmm. one thinks or would read from newspaper articles. Um, the example I will give is partially personal and partially public, but when I first started going to Serbia, uh, people that I would not expect denied Srebrenica. That does not happen today, and the Serbian parliament passed a resolution up uh, uh, apologize in a sense. They didn't say genocide, but they did apologize or recognize what happened in Srebrenica. So this is a, you know, a huge step in the right direction. So I think, uh, you know, and former Yugoslavia could talk all afternoon about, but uh, I think it's a more nuanced uh, discussion. Um, just on the, and the other, only other point I'll, I'll pick up on is on the the, uh, the role of regional organizations, which I think is essential. I think it's already been mentioned. The European Court of Human Rights has you know, had huge impact. The Inter-American Court has had a giant impact, not just on you know, human rights per se, on amnesty questions um, and uh, across the continent. And it's actually enormously and under-recognized what the Inter-American Court has done. Um, if we're talking about uh, criminal trials at the at the regional level. I mean, some of that's been proposed. Uh, I, I would say that should be open for discussion. It depends how it works with the other parts of the architecture, the ICC, national uh, prosecutions. Uh, what what would concern me is if it's being offered as kind of a uh, a cover not to do anything. And that I mean, I think that's the the question that that really arises. So, a few comments. Good. I have Jeff Lorenzi in the second row, and we have time for a few more questions. If anybody has, just raise your hand, question and comment. In the back room will be the second, and I would take a third if there were a third. Okay, let's go, Jeff, and then in the back room. Uh, thank you, Warren. Jeff Lorenzi with the Century Foundation. I know that war crimes are the glamour field for this discussion, but I do want to ask about the International Court of Justice, that it should not be neglected. Uh, when you, uh, Dean Van Genuchten had recalled the Nicaragua case, which impelled the Reagan administration to denounce U.S. Uh, subscription to compulsory jurisdiction, 
Uh, and you think of the consular relations and our frying uh, foreign nationals without having informed consular officials uh, and how that fared in the US Supreme Court. The Israeli barrier east of the Green Line uh, decision from the court and the nuclear weapons uh, illegality, illegality of use question, you kind of get a sense of discouragement about whether anybody is really paying attention to the International Court of Justice. Are there any reasons, Judge Tomka, that you can give us why we should think that actually the ICJ is making some uh, imprint? And, and is there any reason to think uh, that there may be some if not rush some crawl back to enlarging the range of countries that subscribe to its compulsory jurisdiction. I'm behind you, Miko. Well, hi, good afternoon. Robert Young from the ICRC. Um, I, I hesitate to mention what I'm going to mention yes in such a stimulating <clears throat> talk about The Hague, but I think um, as a representative of the ICRC, I probably have to mention one other city in Europe, which is, of course, Geneva. Uh, and I just wanted to mention in this debate, I think the continuing relevance, of course, of the Geneva Conventions, which maybe goes without saying. David almost mentioned it for me, but he didn't quite. But I think in the future of international justice, the ICC, the Rome Statute, is, of course, uh, a huge development. But we're reminded here in New York that its acceptance remains uneven. And in the debate about justice and accountability, the Geneva Conventions and their protocols will, I think, remain highly relevant for the next 40 or 50 years, at least, I think, until the, the Geneva Rome Statute is, is uh, fully accepted. So I wanted, I wanted to mention Geneva with apologies to the friends from, from The Hague. <laughs> uh, and secondly, I, I just wanted to <clears throat> echo, I think, what David had said about the importance of the national level and, and really agree with our, uh, my friend from DPKO, the, the legal specialist, to move beyond this international versus national debate in talking about justice or where it should be rendered. And I think, again, I think the Geneva Conventions provide guidance precisely because every state in, in, in the planet today has accepted the Geneva Conventions and has agreed that certain crimes are so serious that they should be public, punished in national courts, but also have accepted that these are a matter of universal jurisdiction. And I think that's worth recalling in this debate. Now, a, an entirely separate point I just wanted to throw out to widen the debate is precisely the success of if, 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 if what we might, might call the justice and accountability agenda that's been referred to in the last 20 or 30 years. Let me um, refer to it maybe as the Hague effect, the fact of sort of justice emanating out from the Hague and being better known, the idea of accountability being better known around the world. It does pose, and this is just one more issue for, for this distinguished panel to, to mull on, one area it poses uh, challenges, at least for the ICRC, is the, the success of the Justice Project and of investigations, whether national or international, of course, can have effects and can have constraints for humanitarian action on the ground. Because if the international community is seen as uh, in, operating in different countries in order to find answers um, if, in, in, in relation to criminal accountability, this poses some challenges for those of us operating on the ground uh, to provide humanitarian assistance and protection. And I think this is going to be one of the challenges as the International Justice Project advances again, in this next time period, is how will we preserve um, room for humanitarian action, uh, which will still be needed to protect people, indeed, very often the same victims. So I leave that uh, puzzling question for our panel. And I would just also want to mention the importance of the Hague Conventions on Cultural Property as an important part of IHL. Thanks. <laughs> uh, Peter, Peter Tomka, could you answer the ICJ question? And then I think Robert has given us enough time to get to uh, the end of this session with that wide-ranging question. We'll ask the panel to answer all three of them. So Peter Tomka, first of all, the ICJ. Thank you. I have got a very difficult question, in particular as the focus was on uh, two cases uh, uh, involving an uh, important state. Uh, Nicaragua, U.S., and uh, uh, first uh, La Grande later on, uh, Avena uh, case, and two advisory opinions. So uh, based on uh, these examples, one could come uh, to a rather false impression that uh, decisions of the International Court of Justice uh, do not matter. Uh, but uh, I can give you a number of other examples where decisions really uh, matter. That have been 
that these decisions have been respected by the parties uh, in maritime delimitations uh, in the Black Sea, Romania and Ukraine accepted. The boundary is clearly established. In uh, uh, Chad Libya case, which was decided in the 90s, uh, the court adjudicated uh, uh, the boundary issue and uh, Libya withdraw from a, a large part of uh, Chad's territory. Uh, so there have been a number of decisions uh, which uh, have had very uh, practical impact in um, bilateral relations between states. And uh, I think that uh, last uh, 20 years demonstrate there is a growing uh, willingness of states uh, to bring matters, disputes before the states. And sometimes even those who originally argued against the jurisdiction of the court were so happy with the final decision of the court, uh, like Qatar Bahrain. Bahrain originally argued against jurisdiction. Then at the end, both states claimed uh, uh, to be extremely satisfied with the decision. And an uh, institution which benefited from the case was uh, University of Cambridge, because uh, Bahrain paid for the enlargement of Lathopah Research Center as one of the <laughs> professors that acted as the uh, counselor for Bahrain. Um, well, it's true, United States uh, uh, terminated the uh, declaration uh, as a, uh, when the case was brought uh, before the International Court of Justice in 1984. This was not the first case. Uh, France, when Australia and New Zealand brought nuclear test cases, also then terminated. But I think there was a certain impact of bringing these two cases because France, uh, a French president made the declaration which court considers an international law commitment not to conduct any more uh, atmospheric nuclear tests in uh, uh, the Pacific. One can speculate whether such a declaration would have been made in that period without having uh, brought these cases before the International Court of Justice. Uh, in 1960 or 61, when the court rendered the decision on jurisdiction in the Praia Vihar case between Cambodia in Thailand, uh, the court upheld its jurisdiction. Thailand, which argued against, terminated the declaration. Uh, so, but nevertheless, the court was able still to determine the case on the merits. Uh, and now the case is back in the court for interpretation, because there is no other way of seizing the court as uh, through uh, jurisdiction on interpretation, as this jurisdiction is statutory based. It does not depend on any declaration recognizing jurisdiction. Well, uh, I would not be so pessimistic as far as consular convention rights are concerned, this decision in Avena. Of course, uh, mm, uh, unfortunately, there was already one execution, uh, at least, uh, without uh, granting remedy, which the court determined as a review uh, of uh, the cases by uh, American courts, because we are not a court of appeal. Uh, uh, United States Supreme Court uh, decided that uh, decision of the court are not directly enforceable because of the uh, U.S. legal system. Uh, but uh, as you know, uh, there is a proposal in U.S. Uh, Senate to adopt a legislation for these kind of cases. Of course, it takes some time, but I know that uh, uh, there is effort by the administration even the past administration, John Bellinger, when he was a legal advisor of the Foreign Office or State Department, and even currently to adopt the legislation which would, uh, let's say, implement the, uh, and provide a legal basis for review and reconsideration of these cases in American jurisdiction. A nuclear weapons advisory opinion, you know, the court was also to some extent divided on this matter, and it's uh, Sometimes uh, some colleagues have a feeling that when member states the United Nations have a difficult political issue and they cannot agree, they bring the matter to the International Court of Justice, and then <laughs> they continue in the endless discussions. Uh, and as far as I know, this advisory opinion has been on the agenda of the uh, first committee for um, uh, a decade and a half. But, uh, Advisory opinions are nothing more than the legal advice given to the organ which has sought the advice. So it's now for the General Assembly to do 
appropriate steps uh, to take on appropriate ste steps. Uh, I, I recognize that it takes some time, but uh, on the other side, you know, uh, policy, security policy of certain important countries uh, on different continents as far as uh, uh, nuclear deterrent is concerned. Thank you. Um, Willem and David, we have five more minutes. Could you take Robert's target-rich question? And uh, these will be the final comments, and just base it on that. And Willem, if you would go first, and then David, you can bring it up. Then uh, it's my privilege to take two elements of your questions, <laughs> and then I leave the rest. You leave one for me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, maybe we do have different opinions. <laughs> The uh, first is uh, on international criminal prosecution and simultaneously create room for assistance on the ground. I think this is one of your issues. My feeling is overall that, let's say, uh, having humanitarian assistance on the ground is more difficult while the civil war is going on and not so much related to criminal prosecutions. But we also, I think both and most of us here do know, that at some moment in history, doctors without borders, Médecins Sans Frontières, they were claiming that they should also uh, say, this is the party that's guilty and the other party is not to be blamed. And then they discovered clearly that it did make, work, make their work much more difficult. And since then, they more or less abide to the rules as accepted by the International Red Cross. Try to keep your neutrality as long as you can and then I think they can go on quite well, all in all, and again, often because of the civil war is going on rather than criminal prosecution. And then maybe ending up with some sort of a joke, or I don't know whether it's a joke. You were talking about the Geneva Conventions, but you will also know that uh, via Rome, they ended up in the Rome Statute, and that the Rome Statute is executed again in The Hague. So in the end, the Geneva Conventions are Hague Conventions, but Hague Point Two, uh, and uh, <laughs> point taken. And about the acceptance of the statute, that's fully correct. If you look at Europe, it's uh, fully covered almost. If you look at Latin America, surprisingly, almost no country is not a party to the statute, which is great news. If you have a look at Africa, it's about 60%. In the meantime, it's growing every year, one or two nations, so that's in the good direction. And have a look at the Asian part of the map, there is maybe 10% or something like that. And there is a huge gap, but that's a huge gap that is not relating only to criminal prosecution, but also to human rights supervisory procedures to uh, peace and security rules and whatever. So there is work ahead, and that's good for all of us. Thank you. If I'd known William was going to say that, I would have let him go last. But David, uh, you're going to go last. But you can also bring us back to where we began, which is The Hague, since you lived there for a decade. <laughs> well, I was going to say that uh, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to join in The Hague, Rome, Geneva debate. I think they're all three great cities. And uh, <laughs> I've done a lot of good things. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, no one's more uh, aware than I, Rob, of course, of the centrality of the, the Geneva Convention. I did want to just pick up on one of the points that you made going back to a prior life, and, and that is the, the, the tension that can arise between what a, an investigation or what a criminal prosecutor is uh, trying to obtain evidence and the important uh, role that, uh, that um, ICRC and others are playing on the ground. And as, as, uh, as you know, uh, I never want a discussion with uh, the ICRC because you have sort of an exemption, uh, not only in the Rome Statute, but in ICTJ jurisprudence and so forth in terms of sort of the inviability of your uh, materials. Uh, but there is a real tension with a lot of other organizations uh, within the UN system. And you saw this, of course, come front and center. And I guess it was the first stoppage of the Labanga case and uh, the first dismissal of the Labanga case over material from the, from the, from the UN. And uh, if we talk about some of the, we've talked about a lot of different tensions. Uh, it's not just in the peace and justice debate, but the, the question between the safety of peacekeepers, the safety of those humanitarian workers on the ground, and the need for information and evidence that will, at the end of the day, have to be disclosed in some fashion to, uh, to defense counsel and then may, and may get beyond. And this does, this is, this is an issue that 
uh, I had responsibility for it, and it's a very difficult and troubling one because you can ultimately put people, uh, you, you're faced with a Hobson's choice of potentially putting um, humanitarian workers perhaps in danger or letting uh, war criminals off charges, essentially. And uh, I don't, I don't, there's, there's no answer in, in, in the next three minutes that I can give you, but I, I, I think it's a real issue and it, uh, if I hadn't dealt with it, had, had to deal with it, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have all of this gray hair now. I, it's, it's just one of those things that's quite complicated. And when you're in his position, you always seem to win. But uh, when uh, you're dealing with other UN agencies, then you get real tensions between. Uh, it's a, it's not peace and justice exactly. It's safety and justice really. It's safety for those people on the ground. So it's. Uh, uh, maybe Warren, we can have our next. So since I have 12 seconds, uh, maybe we can have our next. Uh, discussion on that subject because it's an important one and it's under under discussed uh, pretty dramatically. Um, thank you, David. Uh, I want to thank all the panelists, but I in particular want to thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, for having brought the peace and justice mission to the U.S. of the city of The Hague to IPI. Thank you.